You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. And I have a, a very nice young man, uh, Anthony Chihuahuas. Uh, he's a uh, molecular biologist. Uh, he studied plant biochemistry for many years, more years than I've been alive, and uh, looking forward to speaking to him. So, Anthony, thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, that, uh, I, when you told me your age, I hadn't realized, of course, that I was well into research before you were even born. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, those sort of things. To me, that, uh, uh, yeah, to me mean, that means you've got a lot of wisdom. And they seem yeah. to get younger every year. That's the trouble. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, very good. So, what um, have you been studying plants your whole career, or have you moved from uh, you know, animals to plants, or what's been your focus for so long? No, I've. Uh, if I go back in my history, um, I had a very good botany teacher at school. He inspired me a lot. Um, he left, I think, in the uh, last but final year that I was at uh, secondary school. Um, but I never lost what he gave me. He gave me so much interest in plants rather than animals. And I did a go to university. Originally, I was going to do a degree in botany. Uh, then instead, I noted that the biochemistry department offered a syllabus that looked very interesting and uh, did, in fact, include uh, some plant material, mainly photosynthesis, alkaloid synthesis, things like that. Things I wanted to hear about, so I changed. I had to get a few more qualifications, but they took me into biochemistry. And I stayed in that department at University College London for six years. I did my first degree and my PhD there. And when it came up to what should I do my PhD on, well, it was a very animal-based department. So, I mean, a lot of the, what I was taught, uh, I learned how to deal with rodents and things like that. I didn't particularly like doing it. Uh, and I much preferred to work with plants. But I, uh, the uh, supervisor gave me a choice. And I said, at school, I had been doing a few experiments with a plant hormone called auxin. And I'd like to continue that if I could. I uh, said, so go ahead. He got me a grant, believe it or not, from the Medical Research Council to work on plants. Um, but I greatly enjoyed doing what I was doing there. And that took me through for my PhD. And I went to the University of East Anglia. It had just been founded at that time. And I continued that work for some considerable period. I published quite a lot. Um, and I got into other areas and started doing other interesting things. Um, protein nucleic acid turnover, for example, occupied me for uh, two to three years. And I produced probably three papers and that. And those papers got me an invitation to go to the plant research lab in Michigan State. It was run at the time by Professor Anton Lang. He wrote a very long letter and invited me saying they were very impressed for the papers. Would I come? So I, I went there for a year, and uh, we then came back. Uh, I enjoyed my time at Michigan State. It was totally new to me. I mean, he, here I am, a hick person in London, going to somewhere where there was so much money, there were such enormous hmm. cars, um, all the, the huge store Myers had everything from cradle to grave, you can imagine. And my first go at... Um, at uh, the, uh, not Burger King, but McDonald's. That's the first time I've yes. ever come across that. 
you know, you walk up and you get your meal in a minute. It, uh, right. That was really something. So I had changed from working on auction. In the meantime, when I moved to the University of Edinburgh, and I started looking at modification of proteins by phosphorylation, um, there was nothing known at the time. So there was the interest and the excitement of asking very s simple and straightforward questions. Did plants use protein phosphorylation? And I was able to produce a paper on that and show that was indeed the case, and it was uh, the routine. And then at Michigan State, um, I, I acquired two other postdocs to help me along, and we produced three papers on my time there. And that continued when I came back. And that carried me on for a goodly number of years. Um, I've got various things going on that. Um, but always behind on my mind was the question, um, protein phosphorylation, you modify the activity of a protein so you change its activity, what it can do. If it's an enzyme, you might activate it by phosphorylation. And there was then our, and I asked the question, what could control, what could modify the enzymes that were modifying these proteins by phosphorylation? They're called protein kinases. And I alighted on calcium. And uh, it was quite a lot in the animal work. I'd um, been doing things at the time, and I tried a few experiments, and nothing worked when I was at Michigan State. And when I came back, um, I tried a few more things, and I carried on then looking at uh, phosphorylation of specific proteins, histones. These are part of the uh, material you find in, in what's called a chromatin. Um, which you find in well, the quick, uh, quick, quick thing yeah, here. So ox oxidative phosphorylation in you know animals, uh, that's what leads yeah, to the creation of ATP, of right? That, which we were trying, in a sense, to duplicate um, with some difficulty because you don't have the same easy facility of large amounts of tissue to work on. Uh, the methods for isolation of various organelles from plants were pretty ropey. Um, it was with great difficulty that we managed to get through some of this material. And I gave up uh, on, the, on the calcium end of things because I couldn't find any evidence at all. Now, it's one of those odd things, you see. I went back to the University of Illinois in Urbana in 1980 uh, to work with a man named Larry Vanderhoff. Um, he disappeared as soon as I got there. And he went over to the East Coast, and he went over there eventually to California, Davis, and then in due course actually became Chancellor of Davis. Um, but it was while I was there in Urbana that I got talking with Jack Hansen, who was head of department at the time. And he talked about calcium and things. He said, there's bound to be something there. Are you sure you've looked at it properly? And I said, well, as far as I know, so he said, I think you should go and have a look again. So I went back to the literature and blow me, I had not read the material properly. If you want to get activation by calcium, what you've got to do is to set up the calcium level properly. You can't use ordinary distilled water. You've got to put in what's called a chelating agent to really get the endogenous uh, water level calcium right the way down, and then you can start to get some sort of activation. And I did that and got a paper out straight away very quickly because there was a protein kinase there we had picked up, was calcium activated, and at very low levels. And that was rather crucial for all the understanding of calcium at the time. And well, quick question here, Anthony. Anthony, I have a quick yeah. question. What, what's, why? Why the interest in uh, protein phosphorylation? Why is that important? You know, it's if you would just summarize most, it at a high level. I think it, it is the most basic method of changing what cells do. Uh, a lot of it started off probably in the late 1950s when animal research with a molecule called cyclic AMP, which is generated in tissues that are treated with adrenaline. Cyclic AMP is what's called a second messenger. That is produced at the cell membrane, and it's released into the body of the cell, and it goes around and it activates various enzymes, mainly protein kinases. 
So it was known to be important and significant in that respect. Now, plants and cyclic AMP have been a, a story that really has never been resolved. I mean, there there isn't much there. Uh, if there is, it doesn't seem to work in the same way as um, in animal cells. So my going for calcium was, in fact, a much more interesting approach uh, because we did know that in animal cells, calcium-activated protein kinase was certainly present. Uh, they were well-defined, certainly a decade before I actually got into the, the, the whole business at all. Um, and the animal people have always led the way in that regard. But we had finally got down to a calcium-activated protein kinase. Now, I should explain that the, uh, the body of the cell is called the cytoplasm, and the calcium level in the body of that cell is extremely low. Its resting level is really in down in the nanomolar region. Uh, and when you want activation, you get a sudden elevation of calcium in the cytoplasm, and that sets all a lot of things in actual motion and gives rise to a lot of final events, which uh, are the result of activating numerous enzymes like protein kinases. Sorry, it's very technical what I'm telling you, but okay. uh, it, it is. Problem, you might get people so, who want to want to listen to that sort of thing. And here well, what, what are some of the what, what are some of the higher level ideas of this? Is it, what does this tell you? Does it tell you that plants and animals have very, have very similar when systems? I, when I or? started with auxin, which is a plant hormone, what what had intrigued me uh, was plant growth and development. How is it regulated? How is it controlled? And auxin is a hormone that's still worked on by large numbers of people. Uh, it has very definite effects on plant growth and development. It may depend on the tissue which uh, is responding, but even so, there is a substantial effect of auxin in many areas of plant activity. So by this means, as so far as one could deduce from all the work at that time, when I was dealing with it in the uh, early 60s, um, auxin was a, a major way in which you could change what plants actually did. You know, if you wanted your plant, for example, to respond to gravity, you could show that there was an influence of auxin on this gravitational bending. Or if it was responding to a particular direction of light and bending towards it, you could also show that auxin had much to do with that particular mechanism. So what I got into was an area where I really wanted to understand um, how plants were actually regulated in terms of their growth and their development. And at the time, auxin was one of those things you actually worked on. Well, that then leads to the rather interesting question, how does auxin actually exert its effect? And at that time, that seemed to me one possibility was that it would increase the calcium inside cells and activate the cell to do that. Uh, that doesn't happen. We now know that auxin doesn't do that, except in one particular case. It's not a, a general case. But my whole area of interest has always been how do plants control what they do? And of course they do what they do. And I mean, crop plants do it. I mean, um, you know, it's of vital importance. How do they grow and develop? How do they um, know how to put roots down in the soil and for the stem to grow upwards? And how does the stem respond to the various things in its environment and then enable it to do uh, what it does? And, and the things that it does, of course, in this case, um, are crop yield. And, and that's a, a vital point. So that's always been a, a motivating force in whatever I've done is to try and see that there is, in fact, an end product in sight for uh, not only for scientists, but for the public at large, so that they understand that when we do research, it's to try, in fact, and improve the lot of mankind rather than just doing it out of a selfish uh, sort of interest of trying to solve a nutty problem. So all my work, which I've, uh, when I worked on these um, things and when we worked on calcium, it was trying to answer the very simple questions. 
How, when a plant perceives a change in its environment, how then does it respond to that change in environment? And calcium became a very important part of that in my life, uh, certainly in the, starting about 1980 and carried on for another two decades. Um, and in that, we did resolve quite a large number of different issues. Uh, and we now know, of course, that it's fundamental to the way plant cells do actually perceive signals and then initiate a response to those signals that they perceive to benefit themselves. So what would you say are some of the big learnings you've had about how plants, you know, act and regulate themselves? If you were to, you know, to a summary of many years of, of research and My work, summary what are, many what are years some of the research is that many of the signals we looked at, and we did do this deliberately, we went through quite large numbers of things which we knew influenced plants. These are things like fungal elicitors, which elicit the defense response for fungi. Uh, we went blue light, for example. Uh, we did a lot of work on growing pollen tubes. And when the pollen germinates on the, on the female part of the flower, it produces a tube which grows down and takes the male cells into the ovary for fertilization. I uh, had a very good uh, postdoc who came from Portugal, Re Marlo, who did some excellent work on that. And we were able, we, we learned, if I can put it like this, how to steer pollen tubes around corners um, by, by manipulating specifically the calcium inside them. We can make them do that. Um, I'm trying to remember all the other signals we looked at. Uh, light was certainly one. Gravity was another. Um, all of these have an influence in, in one way or another on their calcium level. Um, but after about 20 years, I think the satisfaction was quite simply, well, we had established calcium as an important element in the control of what's called signal transduction. And that involved a lot of work on many different systems to establish that so many of them actually um, respond in this way. One of the major ones we came across uh, very quickly was mechanical stimulation. Now, people don't tend to think of plants as being mechanically stimulated, um, mm. but wind and things like that, you know, moves the plant back and forth. That causes stress and strain in the, in the stem, and plant responds usually by strengthening the stem, making it fatter, so that, in fact, it weighs around a lot less. Uh, that was one of the first ones we came across. And we did actually publish a paper on the effects of wind on calcium, and it's, uh, and it's quite easy to demonstrate. And we then got to the stage of thinking, well, if calcium does these sort of things, can we work out where in the cell the calcium is being elevated? Uh, this required a totally new ballpark. Um, it's called imaging. And there was at the time, in, in the... Uh, middle to late 80s, one lab in California run by Roger Chen, who did an enormous amount of work on this, of being able to look inside a cell and say, when calcium is elevated, where in, in the cell itself is it actually elevated? Now, at the time, I had two very good students. One, Simon Gilroy, he's now in Wisconsin, doing, he's going great guns on the work he's doing, and a name Mark Fricker, who went back to University of Oxford. And between us, and I had to use three grants, we got all the equipment together so that we could produce the first images of calcium inside cells. And it was a very exciting time at that to see this sort of thing happening. Uh, still being done. Uh, Simon, for example, in uh, Wisconsin, is still doing calcium imaging and getting extraordinary results out of it as well. But, uh, um, but it, it all started with this need to do this, and it really was hand-to-mouth right at the beginning, buying pieces of equipment. We weren't sure we we're going to work together. Um, it was only with the brilliance of these two people I had that we actually got the whole thing off the road and going. And we did produce um, paper, on uh, individual cells. These were cells which you find in a tissue called the stomata. It's, it's a way in which plants control their exchange of carbon dioxide for water on the underside of leaves. 
and we were able to image the calcium in those and show the regions in which it elevated and the regions which it did not. And that was continued. Uh, had, and it had continued, a plant, particularly uh, in the pollen tube, because the pollen yeah. tube, it's much easier to see where the calcium is. And we did a lot of work on that with a number of different people who just turned up in the lab. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's one of these funny things. When things are going well, uh, the word gets around and other people ask if they can come. And I, I take everyone that could. Um, the group got up to 14 in number at one stage. And they got a bit difficult to manage because I always wanted to know what everyone was doing. How do you spend all your time finding out what everyone is doing without the time necessary for thinking what they should be doing? And uh, so I, I had to let, uh, you know, I had to reduce the number in due course and not, not replace and then refuse more people coming in. But it was a very exciting time in the lab. I mean, it's a, yeah. and the grant money came easily. It's straightforward. We were right at the frontier on that. And uh, we then introduced this new technology. I see it's mentioned in the, what I was sent. That's using this luminescent protein uh, called Iquorin from... Uh, Icoria victoria, which is a jellyfish. Uh, this jellyfish is rather interesting. It, uh, it's a small jellyfish, and it produces what's called a burglar alarm. Um, because when it's attacked by a fish, and it's small enough for fish to try and eat it, it gives off a flash of light. And uh, the basis of this flash of light had been uncovered by uh, a Shimura some years earlier and was due to a protein called Iquorin. And eventually it was worked out that, that what um, Iquorin was responding to was an elevation of calcium inside the cells of the jellyfish. So we got hold of uh, uh, Iquorin, cDNA was made, and plants were transformed with this. And there was a hazard in this procedure, and that is that Iquorin, this luminescent protein, requires what's called a luminophore. It's a small molecule called cilentrazine. And the what's called apoichorin and cilentrazine have to join together. And when they do so, they then will respond to an increase in calcium. And they give off a flash of light. Oh, we were doing this in, uh, let me see now, it must be uh, 1990. I had, a, a, again, a very good student called Mark Knight. He's now head of department at the University of Durham. And um, we were very unsure whether the method was going to work uh, because no one had done it, and we didn't know really how to, how to do it. But it was easy to transform a plant with um, the api quarine, that's the protein part of it all, easy to transform them. And then all we could do was take cylindrazine, which is incredibly light-sensitive, add it from the outside, and hope that the protein would form. Well, it took two years to get to that stage, and it actually proved to be ridiculously easy. Uh, when you just took seedlings and you they were transformed with this protein and then added cylindrazine, they formed the icorin quite easily. And then you could show this quite easily in a simple luminometer. You didn't need any expensive equipment. And... Uh, Within three weeks, I think, we had a nature paper. Uh, we had gone through three or four different things, all of which influenced calcium, and all of which had an enormous impact when we published it. It was easily the simplest paper I've ever produced in the shortest period of time and got a course into nature, which is the, the primary journal for research at that time. And then we use that technology in many different ways. But the interest, what always interested me with Icorin is you're actually looking at what's going on in calcium in the whole seedling. It's, a, it's an aggregate response. And the idea was mind-blowing at first, um, but it's used, been used right, right around the world now. Um, and the paper's been quoted, I don't know, 1,400, 1,500 times, mainly by people who've used the technology. So it was a, an enormous break, breakthrough. And, of course, it convinced me of the importance of calcium in this process of responding to signals. And calcium right. responds to eight to ten different signals. 
So it, it obviously it was a fundamental um, basis of what was actually going on. But that well, Anthony, I got a, I got a question. I got a question here. Yeah, carry on. What, yeah. What? Uh, how does? Well, I don't know. Maybe a big question is how does calcium get into plants in the first place? Where do they get it from? Just the soil, or no, there they other mechanisms the when they get it? I mean, that's that's normally. You've got to have some calcium in the soil. You won't get much plant growth if you don't have any. And well, now we know why. It is, problem, it is a problem because it's often in insoluble form in the soil. Uh, but roots get round that. Uh, they secrete acids to solubilize the calcium uh, while they're growing through so that they can actually take it up and use it. it uh, but that's where it comes from. Um, and it is transported around the plant. And when it's taken into a cell, it's sequestered away in what are called calcium stores. Uh, some of these are in the, what is called a vacuole. It's a repository of a lot of things in um, in um, in many plant cells. Mm. Shovel it away and stuff it away into the vacuole. Uh, there's also another store in the mitochondrion. There's some in the chloroplast. There is other bits and pieces of cell in which the calcium is located but is not released into the cytoplasm where you use them when, when it is actually signaled. So when it's signaled, um, you have this uh, release of calcium from these stores and from outside the cell as well into the cytoplasm, and that then starts a whole sequence of events on that in many cases lead to changes in growth and development. And that's why it became significant and why it was so interesting. So um, it's funny how a second look on something you almost missed changed your whole career and became so important in plant uh, physiology, biochemistry. Yes. It, uh, it, well, you, you, you know, you tend to get led by the research you actually do. Uh, I mean, the, the various people have influenced me at various times, you know. You learn a lot from other people. Uh, one of those I learned a lot from was Jack Hansen, you know, at, when I was at um, Urbana, Illinois. I spent a lot of time talking with him, and he was a lot older than me at the time. I mean, uh, we actually published a paper together while we were there, um, trying to sort some ideas out. And, uh, but he, I don't know what it was, it's just his maturity of attitude. And his rather gentle request that I should try again to look for, you know, activation of protein kinase by calcium. And it, and it, it just, you learn so much from different people at different times of your life. Um, I had a PhD supervisor. I, I learned really very little from him. Um, yeah. but what I did learn was in research, you have to be independent. You know, you, you have to take... Uh, the problem yourself, and do what you can. And then if you need advice, you get advice on specific things. But at the end of the day, you have to be self-propelled. And that has worked with me all my life. I've always decided what I wanted to do, and I've gone ahead and done it. Now, it's less easy in present circumstances for many young scientists to be able to do that. There's much more constraint on what they can do I was lucky I came through at a time when I could choose what I wanted to work on. And if I could get the money, then I could continue to work on it. And so I did do some other things. We worked on abscission at one stage. I enjoyed that immensely. I collaborated with people outside the University of Edinburgh. Um, and then there was a lot of interesting collaboration with other people in the States in one way or another. Um, when I've come, and I've, um, I used to come over quite regularly, in fact, to, to look at a project of which I was supposed to be not in charge, but supposed to be in control, as it were, as an external advisor. So I used to do that, and I enjoyed that tremendously as well. It's, um, the whole thing has just been, uh, from, my, from my point of view, just enormously enjoyable all the way through. And... Uh, it's been so much pleasure to meet so many great scientists in, in my time. And um, I have upset some in my time as well. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you about those if you want to know. Uh, <laughs> perhaps they won't want to know, but I don't suppose many of them are still alive yeah. because I did it when I was young. 
And when you're young, you're rather gauche, you know, and you don't think carefully yeah, about yeah. what you say. Um, but I did do that. With, uh, if I go back to my time when I first went to University of Edinburgh, uh, there, 1980, um, I had kept tabs on the, the hormone area in plants. I, I knew the literature very well. And I was asked to go and give a lecture at the University of Leicester, which is two or three hundred miles south of Edinburgh. Uh, so I thought, well, let's uh, let's spice this up a bit. So I'll make it challenging. So I went down there and gave the lecture. Now, when you give departmental lectures, you always say to people, well, interrupt if you want. Well, it was supposed to be a three quarter an hour lecture and it lasted two hours because of all the interruptions. And then the discussion went on for another hour. That is the longest I've ever done. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I don't know whether I've made any impact there. Uh, and I came back to Edinburgh, and I had a letter from the head of the department there saying, well, you didn't convince anyone here of what you said, but if you want to put it down on paper, I'll see if I can publish it. So I thought, well, why not? I, I knew all the literature. literature. So I sat down and I wrote a very long article. Um, uh, it only took me three months because I knew all the information in the area. And, and that was quite critical of the plant hormone feel. Um, I'll come back to the reason why it became critical in due course. Um, okay. That was published. It had an enormous impact. I had, you know, in those days, you didn't have computers or things like that. I had 620 reprint requests within three weeks for that article. Yeah. I'd only ordered 100 reprints. I mean, I just didn't have it to give out. It was yeah. radical in the sense that what I'd suggested was uh, in the plant hormone era. I said people are just working on the idea that the concentration of the hormone inside cells is critical. There's another feature behind it. It's called sensitivity. And the sensitivity is not only of equal importance in many cases, it is a thing that changes. It's not the concentration. And I provided, I think, evidence from eight or nine different subjects that showed that to be the case. And um, I was asked then to write oh, seven or eight different publications in different journals on this. You, you run out of steam quite quickly because you just end up saying exactly the same thing. Um, but it was radical in the sense that it, it upset quite large numbers of um, people much more elderly than me who had made their careers on the particular topics and me being gauche and, and not thinking very clearly about it had obviously trodden on a lot of toes. Now, I noticed in one of this, you know, you say that uh, um, my career was held back. Um, that was by one of those I had upset. And that was Anton Lang, who was running the plant research lab at the time. I had yeah. been there previously, and he didn't know anything about this. But I could see when I saw him again in 1980, uh, there was no um, no friendly atmosphere anymore for, from what I, what I had written and what I had done. Yeah. Now, I still think I was right to do it. The younger generation regarded me much as a hero because they thought... Uh, this area of research was pretty redundant and wasn't getting anywhere at the time. So by my questioning what had gone on, actually made an enormous difference to people's attitudes toward it. Towards it. Um, How? How so? Now, well, you know, I noticed in what you sent me that, that uh, this book, General Systems Theory by Ludwig von Bertalanffy, let me go back on that and say why this this upset in, in the plant hormone field actually occurred. I purchased this book by von Bertalanffy in 1972. It's when it came out. Uh, it's called General System Theory. And I was intrigued because I thought, what is this? I've never heard of this before. What is it? Now, I read the book very quickly. I mean, it's a, it's a very easy to read book. Um, but what it did was profoundly change my understanding of what we were dealing with in biology. I was brought up as a biochemist, and as a biochemist, uh, during my undergraduate days, the great achievements were what people have been taking things apart um, 
and finding out that this is important, that's important, that's important, that's important. It's called reductionism, and you reduce these very complex uh, cellular processes by taking out the bits. And the general idea of reductionism is you then just put it back together again and it'll all work. What von Bertalanffy showed is it doesn't work that way. Uh, what you got is a system, and a system is constructed from very large numbers of very complex networks. Now, when I got hold of von Bertalanffy's book, I thought, this is radical. What is in our library that, that's followed this up? There was really very little. Um, there was some work on management structures, which you can see from a systems framework, has a very different perspective, and it's trying to answer, you know, how the whole system works. And there was another book on economics by Forrester, I remember. Um, there were books by Paul Weiss, um, who was clearly into this. And then it reminded me of something I had read and been given to read when I was an undergraduate, a book by Roger Williams called Biochemical Individuality. I had never understood William's book. I had read it and I thought, how quaint, but this is intriguing. What William's book was about was actually looking at the variations between individual humans in all the possible things he could lay his hands on. And the one that interested me greatly was hormone levels between different individuals. And these were normal, healthy, reproducing human beings. And you could get differences of 20 fold in some of the hormone levels. And you read this and you think, how do these people function? What can it be? And yeah, it's out. amazing. Yeah, I mean, the point about this, the system, of course, tells you how it can do that. Because if you haven't got this huge variation in hormone levels, then a change in the sensitivity, the ability of cells to respond to that hormone might compensate in that way. So if you've got a very low level of hormone, you make the cells ultra-sensitive. Um, and if you've got huge amounts of hormone, you make them uh, weakly sensitive. And by that means, then you get a compensation between the two. So what... Yeah general system theory teaches you to do is to look at how the relationships of all these things function, how they all connected together. And once you start to get them connected together, you then start to realize that in fact, you're on a totally new area of understanding. Now, if I can go back to where the plant hormone situation was in 1980, what general system theory told you to look at was what is called the context. And the context is everything else in that complex network that surrounds the thing you're actually looking at and modifies the way it works. I interpreted that as sensitivity, and that's what I wrote when I wrote that. And that was the first time I'd ever been able to use the understanding I got from general system theory. I did carry on a little bit later, and I... I started uh, in one article in 1986. I put down uh, quite simply what was a quite complex synthetic pathway of, of a particular amino acid, and I, I drew it, in fact, as a simple neural network uh, of the sort you know you can get in, in human nervous systems and things like that. But then I couldn't really understand how I could use any of this material. I read up the history of it. I was au fait with that. Um, when Plant Cell asked me if I would contribute something in 2006, I decided right. I would give them the history of system theory uh, so that they got a good background on that. It's now, of course, okay. a well-established process by which people investigate what's going on because we now all realize that cells are extremely complex networks of interactions between the proteins. In something like, you know, the weed or Arabidopsis that so many people use, uh, there are at least 24,000 proteins in any single cell. These interact in various complex ways to make a very complex network and produce the activity that we call a cell. Uh, so it's... So how, a, do we, uh, how do we hope to understand these systems if they're so unbelievably complicated? 
You, yeah, you ever well, feel like you quail in front of the complexity of it? Is a really critical question because networks are everywhere. I mean, you live in a network, in fact, a political network, an economic network, and a social network. What you do influences other people. And it's a matter of working out these influences and how they are conveyed through the network, the structure of the actual network, what connects with what. Um, there's been a, the area of a huge amount of study over the last, certainly, uh, 30 years. I mean, people have really got to grips with this thing and do find, yeah, I mean, all sorts of ideas and things have been generated about this. And these days, it is routine for people to try and sort out which protein interacts with how many other proteins, which ones they are, what's the identity of them, to try to put a little bit of this network together. Um, and yeast, they got a long way. And yeast is a, you know, a simple single cell, uh, a lot fewer genes, and they have got to an extent of interactions of all particular proteins with each other. There's been some remarkable technology behind all this that had enabled them to do that. But for me, it was a conceptual change that I found, uh, which just changed my perspective on, on what was going on. You still work in a sense in a, in a the old reductionist fashion, you still try to take things apart, but you have to be aware all the time that it's interacting with a thousand and one other things uh, which you need to know about if you're going to better understand it. But these complex networks, are, are, and I do mean they are very complex. And, of course, if you come to the uh, neural networks in human beings and you know your brain has a billion nerve cells in there, well, the number of connections between those nerves, billion nerve cells is a thousand times higher. So the, the connections between all these things are what creates for you and for me what I'm doing to you now. Enables me to talk, manipulates all the muscles in my vocal cord and takes in this information which I'm hearing from you and you're hearing from me at this time and sorts it out into information. It's probably the most complex network there is in the universe at present. I mean, that, that gives rise to that. And trying to sort out how that network functions is, is going to be the major target for the next 50 years, probably, in research. Unfortunately, I won't be there to see it. But um, for me, it was the interest. What it gave me was established in my mind uh, it was a controversy over plant hormones. I called it the context. I called it sensitivity. People interpreted that in different ways. But it started to change that area of research. It started to move, in fact, into different areas to try and sort out what were some of the connections uh, from the plant hormone onwards and put down a lot less the... Um, just simple measurement of hormone concentration. That didn't go well, we're close well. to uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually running up on time soon, but what do you see as um, new and upcoming? Where is the uh, plant research world going right now? What are some of the new things that people are looking uh, at? It's, it's, it's still very molecular, and quite rightly so, I think. It's, um, it uses a model plant called Arabidopsis, and it's using that, its purpose of using that is to sort out gene products and see how these can be used uh, to improve crop growth and development. I spent a lot of the last, mm, on and off, talking about plant intelligence. And let, let me say what that is, because uh, people get the wrong end of the stick here. Uh, they... Uh, <laughs> they um, when I talk about the word intelligence, people's minds immediately think of human intelligence. It isn't that at all. Right. It's uh, any organism that lives in a variable environment has uh, many problems in terms of survival. And what intelligent behavior actually is, is when an organism experiences either threatening circumstances or severe competition, it modifies its behavior to improve its chances of survival. Now, that is what we call normally intelligent behavior. 
the difficulty I have had since I first started talking about this 2003 is that people immediately take the word intelligence and think, what's he trying to do? Is he trying to say, you know, a plant has a brain and it thinks and it speaks? And, it, and of course, it isn't that at all. It is a very general property that all organisms face that live in these variable, often threatening environments. And we know they're threatening because uh, from what Charles Darwin said, there's enormous overproduction. And uh, so very few things actually survive through to the next generation. Uh, that being the case, there is normally a threatening circumstance. And what we actually see is the way plants respond in these threatening and highly competitive environments. And the way plants do respond to that is they change their growth and development. In the do you think there's, uh, case, case do you think there's intelligence even at the cellular level? or just the organism level? It's, it's the organism which does it, and almost certainly hormones are something to do with it. I mean, this is, it brings me back, in fact, to what I originally worked on. And uh, what, what you can actually see modifications, they're very well known. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. You know, if there's more nitrate in the soil, for example, a plant will produce more root. I mean, it's, why does it do that? Um, well, the experiments have been done show that the real reason for doing it is not so much to take up more nitrogen, or it happens to do that, but it's to stop its competitor nearby getting any. So if it can remove it first, it, it benefits. You know, it's improved its survival possibilities, and it's taken it away from the competitor at the side. But if you remember, if you remind yourself, it's all to do with survival, and the probability of survival, because so very few plants and animals do survive to get through the whole life cycle and to carry on in reproduction. Uh, so there is this uh, fierce fight going on all the time, the struggle for existence, which is so important. And so when I talk about plant intelligence, I'm talking about bacterial intelligence, about animal intelligence. It's all the same biological basis at the end and it's always arisen quite simply because uh, we have overpopulation uh, amongst animals bacteria and plants and a lot of things have just simply got to fall by the wayside uh, those which are more intelligent than others have a higher probability of survival but at the end of the day many of those are going to go anyway so it's uh, so we, we have this very interesting area of study, which I'm writing on right at this moment, um, and I'm still doing something on that. And I've got a very long article coming out. It's now been accepted, um, which uh, sorts out many of these uh, interesting areas of, of research. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Anthony, we're, we're just about at the end of time. So what's, what's the best way for people listening to learn more about your previous work and your current work? How can they get in touch or find out more? How can they get in touch? I yeah, or find out more. Yeah. Papers, yeah, and articles. So, I mean, if they look up my name, they will find uh, what they need with, without any trouble at all. Uh, my name is unusual. Trevorvis mm. is a, it's a Cornish name. Now, Cornwall yeah. is the southwest tip of Britain. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual area. Um, it's very rugged. Uh, if you've never been to Britain, I always recommend people take a trip down there just to see what it's actually like. It's very rocky, some excellent beaches, it's quite warm down there, and uh, there's an expression by tree, pole, and pen, by this you shall know Cornish men. Uh, my name is Trevorvis. It's a, a Cornish word because Cornwall had its own language uh, for <laughs> many centuries. Uh, there's still a few hundred people that speak it. It's very similar to a language in Wales called Welsh and in Brittany called Breton. Uh, they, it's an ancient Celtic language. And uh, um, the, the, uh, they can't mistake my name. So far as I know, I'm the only scientist at the moment publishing with the name of Trevorvis. I, I do okay. have... I do have an, a great aunt who used to publish a lot on fishes, or lesser wind through all this, but uh, she died some years back. So it's uh, so if they want to find out, um, the other thing is my book, Plant Behavior and Intelligence, that's published in 2014, 
um, I'm amazed that I actually managed to write it uh, because there's a lot okay. in there uh, that is a benefit to people. I start off very simply and I cover the whole range of a huge number of things, things which I've gathered over the years and I put down in that book. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's got a lot there okay. that they can find it and follow it up. Well, very good, okay. Anthony. Thank you for coming on the, the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope that's some help to you. Okay? Okay. Bye, right. then. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.